So I will say good morning and thank you all for attending. Um, today's topic here is on uh, flower bulbs and hopefully we will be able to help you with some of the questions that you might have or I can expound to you on some of the other bulbs that you may not know about and maybe uh, bend your, your will as to what you're planting at your house. Um, because some of you may be new to the area and uh, not realize what happens to some bulbs if you live out in the, uh, the great wild west. <laughs> All right. So what I'd like to start with is a lot of people are familiar with crocus, but uh, they're not as familiar with the fall-blooming crocus, and so we will start now. Uh, for this period of time, and um, we'll talk about uh, three of the different fall crocus. But uh, these you plant in the fall and they bloom in the fall. You plant them in September and they bloom in September or October. And uh, some of the bulbs are quite small, as you can kind of hear me, see me rattling around in the bag. There's like 10 bulbs in this bag here and uh, these will shoot up and, and have these gorgeous little crocus flowers uh, for you. Is that a year later? It's this year. They will pop up, they will pop up this year, flower, and then die down, and then the foliage comes up in the spring. Okay, you don't get any flowers with those um, in the spring. They do all their, their gloriousness in the fall. Now, um, they come in a, a purple, they also come in a pink like this. So another one for you. And your uh, fall crocus normally don't like to be kept very wet. So they can uh, be normally placed in an area in the flower bed where it may be a little drier um, or in a spot where it um, doesn't water it as often. Uh, usually I try not to have people plant them next to a lawn or where they're planting a lot of high water annuals like you may be putting in for impatience or petunias or something like that. But you can put them off to the side where you have uh, lower watered annuals like maybe marigolds or something like that um, that may freeze off early enough for these to pop up and have a show of their own. Now lastly, um, with these, there are the giant crocus. And, uh, geez, he looks kind of like he's a little uh, Viking with, with one here. And uh, you can see that he's all ready to go, and these are going to have um, quite large uh, flowers. They are at least the size of a silver dollar, where these other ones here are usually the size of about a nickel to a quarter. And... Uh, um, they will open up and they're usually a mauve color and they just go great almost any place. We've got them planted out in the flower bed out here and should you come in about two weeks they will be up. You can plant them now and in about two weeks they will be up. They are just absolutely terrific and then again they die down after they're done and then next spring up comes the foliage so you remember that you have something there and not to dig it up and throw it away, um, which can happen sometimes. Now, I would like to go back to the first crocus that I showed you here, the, this fall crocus, and um, just inform you that these little anthers that are inside the flower, this is what you end up um, harvesting you, you harvest this for your, the pollen there, and then they, they turn that in um, to, to the store, and, and you get uh, saffron. And so if you are familiar with cooking with saffron, saffron in the safe and you have to go and ask for them and they bring it out and it's you know quite expensive you can grow your own saffron now I would like to inform you that it 
takes an acre of these to basically make a pound of saffron. And you have to go out with tweezers and tweeze the anthers off and drop them into the bottle and dry them. So it's a little time consuming, but uh, it's, it's something that uh, you now know where your food comes from. Okay. All right. Next in line, we'll pop back to the normal spring flowering crocus. And um, there are the giant type of crocus. And then uh, there's your species type crocus. Uh, your species generally will go and multiply and naturalize for you on their own. And they're usually a smaller flower and it opens generally a little flatter. It opens up and lays flat more so than your uh, giant crocus which will come out and the petals curve up a bit for you. So you can end up to either of these and if you're not familiar with what naturalizing means it, it generally indicates to you that uh, once you plant them you don't ever have to dig them up and they keep multiplying and growing larger and larger in an area and uh, it is a an object that you don't have to spend a whole lot of time with fussing around with. Now um, I tell you that because we'll get over to the tulips and tulips are one of those kind of got to be fussy with bulbs if you really want to be a great tulip farmer. Um, so all right now your uh, regular crocus are basically your first um, major bulb to flower in the, and I like to say it's one of those bulbs that's going to herald in spring for you and they come in a number of colors blue, purple, uh, white, yellow and uh, very showy you can buy them uh, as solid colors or you can end up buying them in a mix if you uh, care to. Now um, we went from fall to early spring and and we kind of skipped over winter. Now we're going to go back to winter because it's on this rack and then we'll be able to pretty much finish. Well, now we're going to back up for a second. I'm going to talk to you about garlic because garlic is another fall bulb. And uh, I'm going to make mention of this in, in the future of our talk today. But you end up, you get your garlic now and you can put it out, plant it and uh, your garlic will need to be chilled through the winter in order to make a nice large clove. Now these garlics that you buy here are uh, disease and insect free. The garlics that you may buy at the grocery store just out of the bin do not have to be um, seed certified disease and insect free. So um, Nevada, if you weren't familiar with it, is one of the um, great garlic producing capitals uh, of the United States for seed garlic because we don't have a lot of disease and we don't have a lot of insects here. And um, to try and help keep it that way, if you can buy seed garlic when you're planting, that makes you know, just that fewer chances of there being disease spread out through the area um, where you can... Yeah, garlic is fairly low watering, very easy to, to grow. And uh, um, there's a lot of nice things about garlic. You can use it to cook with. <laughs> yeah? <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You can put it around your rose bushes. You can wear it around your neck to ward off vampires. Um, my son is reading one of the, the vampire series books now. Um, but uh, a lot of times people aren't familiar with the different types of garlic. And uh, this is a Spanish garlic called Rojo. Uh, a little uh, spicy here. And... Uh, um, uh, it's also called uh, Greek garlic, also, for that. Um, next, we've got your German red. This is a red garlic. Uh, it stores well for you. And it's got a um, large, very large bulb for you. 
Then we come over here to the um, artichoke garlic, and this is another red. And this uh, comes out of the uh, uh, Indian Reservation up in Washington. And this is labeled as the very best of the soft neck garlic. So if you're into braiding um, your garlics, this is one that you probably would want to end up growing. And then we've got your early Italian here. And uh, again, it's your white striped. A lot of times you're very familiar with this one being Italian garlic. Um, it's got your traditional flavoring to it. Um, so we can end up passing these around and I'll just let you look at the difference in sizes between the German garlic and the Italian purple here and then <clears throat> the Spanish and the uh, um, let's see how good my um, Indian is is Inchilium, Inchilium red so and you can see the different sizes there and now, elephant garlic is a uh, very large bulb clove garlic, but um, we've been finding that uh, for most of the gardeners, it usually freezes solid in the winter and, and turns to mush. And so we're going to now be carrying more of the elephant garlic in the spring. Um, and you plant it fairly early on, generally in uh, March. You've got enough chilling then uh, for it to make a bulb without it getting frozen so much like we would see through our winters here. All right, back to uh, your winter bulbs. Now I don't have any amaryllis right now which are those great big bulbs. Those are going to be coming in about a month. But uh, I wanted to let you know about some of the different paper whites. Now paper whites are uh, um, narcissus that will not overwinter outside here okay and uh, you buy it you plant it it grows for them it dies down you usually throw it away okay you don't try and save it you can't plant it out anywhere where you uh, are thinking that you know it'll come back next year in the garden um, they don't do that so with with your paper whites, um, some people, you know, they, uh, they have quite an aroma. And uh, there are those people that enjoy the aroma. And then there's others that say, you know, it just chases me right out of the room, the section of the house, the whole house, halfway down the neighborhood. Um, but your most pungent are your Zivas. Okay, and this is uh, Z-I-V-A, and uh, they're uh, one of your taller blooming, and they take a little longer uh, to come up and start blooming than uh, some of the others. Now, uh, next in line, your uh, Chinese sacred lily, and this is generally a little smaller in size bulb than uh, what your zivas were. And uh, there are other whites, um, and Ziva, like I said, was the most pungent. The uh, Chinese sacred lily is white with a yellow cup on the inside. And that's one of the easiest ways to differentiate uh, when it's blooming. Um, but they have about half the strength that the Zivas have. And then if you like something that's quite mild, in fragrance and you want something to act a little more as a perfume you may look at these uh, uh, Grand Sol de Oro here and uh, these are all yellow with uh, an orange in the center and um, they they are one of the nice nice ones for those that want a little fragrance without uh, feeling like it's knocking you over so, um, and these are again all for indoor forcing. Now we do have a, a cute little thing uh, for you about uh, how to make them intoxicated. And uh, if one of you has this here, 
intoxicating paper whites. And uh, what is kind of interesting is that they found out that if uh, you use some alcohol in with your uh, paper whites here when you're uh, growing them, it uh, keeps them shorter so that they don't grow so tall and then get floppy and fall over. So uh, this, this is a, a cute little tip for you. The other item is, is that uh, um, a lot of times when you go and you uh, put plants where they are, put the bulbs in where they are in the dark longer or in a darkened room, they kind of stretch and the stems are white and yellow and then green at the top. Um, they will grow taller in that form so they then become leggy and flop over. If you can put them in a window that uh, gets as much light as possible, such as the south window in the wintertime, then this will in turn give you generally shorter plants also because they don't have to stretch out um, near as much and get uh, leggy. Now, um, since we're part of the way in here, I would like to just mention that we do have uh, a couple of little different implements for you. And uh, one of them is the, the drill. And anybody in here have a power drill? You can end up hooking this on and this drills into the soil okay so that you can dig holes um, we do sell these bulb diggers okay and um, for who live in a sandy place in Nevada they work quite well for all of you that live in a rocky place in Nevada <laughs> um, your drill works um, quite well for you in that aspect now uh, since most of you are, are ladies in here, I don't know how many of you have uh, commercial type power drills or heavy duty um, drills, but I would like you to, you know, here's Tim, Tim Allen, Tim Taylor, Tim the tool man, more power, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, you're going to need more power to run the big auger here. This usually cannot go on the little battery-operated Makitas or anything like that. You need a, a heavy-duty electric to run this, okay? You can use the little Makita type or, or a power, a little battery power one for bulbs this size. But uh, um, for those of you that want to do the big one... Um, you're going to need the, the big drill for you. Now the big drill uh, runs you a little more money of course. Um, it, it's about $25 where the small one is around 10 and if uh, you realize just how hard it is out there sometimes to be digging then you'll find that uh, items like that can make a big help. The other um, item that you can end up getting is the uh, stand-on bulb planter and I don't have one here to show you but I'm sure you're all familiar with them. Uh, should you be living in Nevada and realize the type of soil that you're dealing with do not go down and buy the cheap shiny aluminum looking one because after one or two steps in on the soil the handle usually bends and it falls apart. If you're going to buy something um, buy the twenty, thirty, forty dollar one that's all metal, kind of heavy, you don't want to drag it around but that one is the one that you really want to have. Now, um, there is bulb dust and time to time people get insects in their bulbs and the bulb dust is something that you can put down while you're planting it will help kill off those insects sex for you. And then the other part that uh, we have is something called bulb guard. And this you um, end up mixing in and uh, pouring down around your bulbs and it gets absorbed into the bulb to make them taste bad. And so this will help keep the um, delightful 
wildlife that you so inadvertently are caring for out in the garden um, that come in and eat off all the flower tops. Now, uh, this will work for one season and then it's done. And um, there are times when uh, at high pressure, uh, which means that there's not a lot of other food out there or not a lot of moisture, where you can treat with this and the animals still will come. So I want you to be aware of it. Now, uh, when you're planting, a lot of times you'll be reading and they'll say, oh, go and use some bone meal, okay? Bone meal is all organic and it's uh, one of these items that's fairly high in phosphorus. Your first number is nitrogen, second number is phosphorus, number is potash. Your phosphorus helps with um, root growth, bulb growth, flowering, things like that. Being that it's all natural like this and that we don't have a whole lot of soil microbial activity native, it will take you around uh, five to seven years for your bone meal to become all used up. And for me, I think that's way too long. And uh, the other side is, is that phosphorus moves very slowly through the soil. So if you happen to live in a windy spot, anybody live in a windy spot? Oh, one young lady here, all right. Um, <laughs> it's just normal, okay. It, if you just put it on top of the ground, it, you can have it blow away. And uh, that's something that I normally don't want to have happen for you. So, um, <laughs> yeah, neighbor's garden looks good. Um, Dr. Earth here has uh, fish bone meal, but he's also added microbes to it. And so this will go and help with the uh, breakdown of the organic matter here to help uh, allow the phosphorus to become available for faster development for your roots, your corms, your bulbs, and your flowers. So, um, I'm a strong pusher of Dr. Earth products because this has the microbes which will cause the fertilizer to actually start working uh, in just a matter of weeks rather a matter of years and you don't have to buy one that says that it's uh, strictly for bulbs um, if I can step in here for just a second and not dump this on you uh, here's some Dr. Earth and this is rose and flower fertilizer Bulbs are a flower, okay? So you can end up, if you have uh, some rose and flower foods, you can end up putting that down. But it's very important that you mix this into the soil. And with any of your Dr. Earth products, they're all organic, so that they won't burn uh, for you. And uh, the phosphorus being down in the soil actually gets them to get going quite a bit faster than if you just sprinkle it on the top. Um, a lot of times people don't realize that nitrogen moves quickly through the soil, phosphorus moves very slowly, so you can constantly have phosphorus in your fertilizer, such as a triple 16 or a triple 12 or like your bone meal here, which is 3.15.0, but the phosphorus itself takes a long time. It only moves about an inch or so in a year through the soil. It takes a long time to get down into where that root mass is, so it's always good to try and incorporate that in. All right. Um, next, we'll go to this rack right here. And uh, on this rack, we have uh, on the top, we've got your hyacinths. Now, hyacinths here are poisonous, okay? and they cause skin irritation and they have, I feel, one of the best fragrances of all the bulbs that you can have and they don't, don't make a great cut flower they don't, they've got a real short stalk like that so if you uh, have them in an area out in the garden where the wind may um, blow the fragrance towards the house for you uh, in the uh, early spring where you may have a window open and being enjoying the day 
uh, your hyacinths would be an excellent choice. Now, they are poisonous deer and squirrels. So if you live in the great outdoors, out sometime, someplace, somewhere outside of a lot of the interior city limit, um, you should almost always plant some hyacinths out there because the animals won't get them and if you're really wanting bulbs um, this is a great place to start. Now with your hyacinth bulb they are a fairly large bulb and uh, they make a nice large flower head for you. These do not uh, spread like the little grape hyacinths here that we're going to get to. Um, but they they will stay there and generally these hyacinths will last you uh, anywhere from about three to eight years and then they kind of fade away because they've spent most of their energy. Um, whenever you're handling these I made mention that they can cause a rash. Do not handle them and then rub your eyes or do anything like that because you can irritate your eye um, and uh, it always seems like, you know, my mother always told me, don't t touch your eyes after you do that. And you're like, oh, mom, come on. I wouldn't do a thing like that. Okay. Um, so it seems like as soon as they tell you not to touch something, you do it anyhow. All right. Happened with Adam and Eve. <laughs> Happened with Adam and Eve. That's right. Okay. Now down to the little gray piacents here. Um, these guys are, are a true naturalizer, okay? And if you haven't ever had the pleasure, um, you can plant them one place in your yard, and then, you know, if not the squirrels digging them up and moving them, then they seem to just move by themselves. I'm not sure how they do this, but uh, over in Europe, and if you're ever reading through... Uh, New England magazines or European magazines, a lot of times you'll see that they have these planted in their lawn. And, uh, you know, a lot of times they're growing these. I know a house over here uh, in my neighborhood where they're growing in the lawn and the people like to just run them over with the lawnmower <laughs> because they, they don't like their lawn looking anything but pristine and they don't want to go out and dig the little bulbs up. But... Uh, they're, they're quite cute, and they can spread, um, and once you get them in one spot, you'll usually find them someplace else. So, um, look forward to having those. If you, if you say, I have never grown a bulb, okay, this is the bulb for you, because it's like foolproof. Now, people will say, okay, I've never grown a bulb before, what do I do? Generally, you want to dig a hole that is around three times um, deeper than what the bulb itself is, okay? And uh, so when we look at, at uh, these bulbs here, this guy is a bulb right here, and it's got a little baby bulb off the side. The baby bulb is called a bulblet, okay? I'm not making it up, okay? <laughs> I'm just telling you what it's called. So these bulblets here normally don't have enough energy to flower for you the first year, okay? But they will make themselves a bulb then, and then it will be able to, in one or two years, flower for you. So we look at the size of the bulb here, and, and uh, we say, well... You know, according to Dave, it's, you know, about as big as his thumb, so we need three thumbs depth in order to plant this guy down, okay? Well, my thumb is a little bigger than about an inch and a quarter, inch and a half, so we want to be putting these down around three inches or so in the soil when we're planting them. And you want to leave that little bulblet on there because, like I said, that will grow out and... Uh, make its own bulb where we talked about our little Viking here earlier well not that guy well here's one with a little better horns um, but when we look at this 
you know, I can put one thumb here and then one thumb there, and so it's, you know, two thumbs tall. So this has to be planted down twice as deep as what uh, these little um, mis hyacinth muscari were planted, okay? So if that was going down around three to four inches, this needs to go down around six to eight inches in the ground. And generally that's the best rule of thumb to follow, <laughs> okay? Oh, I know, I just couldn't uh, pass that one up. Here's a, uh, a new and different uh, muscari. This one here looks uh, real fuzzy for you, kind of like the little Swiffer, you know, that you, they're dusters that you're doing. Um, quite cute and uh, um, in a new color also for you. So these are, are uh, a handy little thing to be looking at. Now we already talked about some of our crocus there. But as you see here, I told you on the giant crocus, these guys, the um, petals stay up more. And on the species, which these are species in the bag, and I'll just pass these around so you can see the different size of the bulb between the species crocus and the um, giant crocus, what you're looking at. And again, these flowers open up a little wider than what uh, your giant crocus flowers end up doing. Okay, now we're going to be also looking at other species items such as tulips here in just a moment. And it all follows through species is generally shorter and uh, a smaller bulb, but also a great naturalizer for you. So, okay. Um, since we're, we're through those now, I'm going to jump back here, back to the tulips. And uh, I will tell you that if, if you enjoy feeding the wildlife, the rabbits, the deer, the squirrels, okay, have any of those around in your neighborhood, um, tulips are the things for you to buy, okay? If you live in town where you don't have a whole lot of those, these are the things for you to buy to enjoy, okay, because you'll get flowers on them. You live out in the country, you get stems. Okay? And you had a flower for 24 hours? Okay, well, once in a while. <laughs> All right, so um, with your tulips, there are some very short growing tulips. And uh, uh, this is in the species family. And when you look at these, the bulbs are small here. And you can see this is a nice one because uh, it's got variegated foliage on here uh, to give you more interest than just having the flower alone. And uh, you can enjoy these as you're out there. But your uh, species tulips are low growing. Now, the shorter the bulb, or the shorter the flower, the earlier it's going to bloom. And this happens on almost anything that you look at buying in the flowering community, whether it be an annual or a perennial or a bulb. If it's going to grow tall, it's going to bloom late in the season. Generally, if it's going to be short, it's going to bloom early in the season. So it's not always true, but it's a, a good thing for you to, to follow. Now, the other nice thing about short bulbs here is that should we happen to get a snow while they're blooming, the snow can't bend this big huge stem over and break them off. Should the wind happen to blow, okay, we're not looking at a giant flower sitting some 18 inches to two feet up off the ground looking like it's trying to act as a hot air balloon tethered to the ground in, you know, some huge windstorm. So a lot of times, uh, you know, people get frustrated. They, they'll come in here and they'll say, they'll look down and they'll look at this tulip called Uncle Tom and they'll say, oh, that is just a beautiful double tulip there. And, you know, they live 
someplace where they don't have houses and board fences all around their community, they don't have big shrubs, they don't have an established neighborhood like we do in town, and they end up trying to grow this, and then they end up with uh, some basal foliage and a nice stalk, and everything else above it is gone, okay, because the wind has just ripped this completely to shreds. I know we don't have hurricanes here, but at times we have winds that are about as strong. Okay, on the edge, usually they will tell you how deep to plant the bulb, and so on the front here, it shows you in the dark area, it says about six inches down, and it tells you about how tall it can end up growing, which is around 12 inches. And then on the other side here, it'll tell you that this is early spring. Now, there are some people that want their whole yard to be just glorious color for one or two weeks, and then there's other people that want to have color for extended periods of time. Okay, this one over here will tell us that it's going to grow up to be about 18 inches tall, but it blooms in late spring. So if you're out and you're one of those people that want to have all your color at one time, look because you can get these that are all late spring flowering, or you can buy some that are all early spring flowering or mid spring. Now. You say, boy, he's being kind of vague with this early spring, mid spring, late spring thing, okay? But we have uh, people from Tahoe. We have people from, you know, out there in Fallon, Urington. We have people from uh, down in Gardnerville. We have people from Reno, Topaz Lake, okay? It's all different as far as when spring comes for you. <laughs> yeah, even within the neighborhood. All right. And so normally uh, we, we would think that early spring is sometime around tax day. Okay. For those people that are down here in the valley, you usually will start having some color. And uh, early April is time when, when you can have some of this. You should be out there planting garden, your, uh, you know, cold weather crops such as pansies and cabbage and carrots and things like that. Okay, then your uh, um, mid spring is usually late April there, and then uh, uh, late spring is usually in May. Okay, so I don't know any of you not live through a spring here. Okay, all right. So usually spring we have some of the worst winds that people are usually out in, okay? Uh, I say that because I know in the wintertime we get some hellacious winds, but fortunately we're smart enough to be huddled inside around the television or fireplace or whatever keeps us warm. Um, and we don't have to be exposed to those, those huge winds like that. But uh, in the, the spring, the winds can be, you know, 60, 70 miles an hour in places, and it does a lot of damage. So um, we can look at these. Now, um, also on the tulip, a lot of your tulips are a single flower, okay? And that means that the stalk comes up and you have just one flower. There are... <coughs> um, a couple of tulips that are out there that are a multiflora, which means that they have multiple flowers at the top of the stem. And so um, you can end up looking at this and you'll say, well, how do I know it's not just, you know, four plants with four flowers is when, you know, you listen to me tell you that they're multifloras. That's one, one thing, but you can also usually figure out when they show a whole lot of them close in a picture like that or in a picture like this where all these little flowers are popping up um, well this isn't a true multiflora they'll have smaller bulb the bulblets on the side will come up and, and do that this is a real multiflora for you where it comes up branches at the top and uh, 
then goes and, and uh, has the flowers for you. And, and for those of you that are interested on these guys, these are a late spring bloomer. And uh, it's called Antoinette, and they get to be about 14 inches tall. And here's another one called Cloud Nine, usually in the picture. <clears throat> Again, it shows you multiple flower stems coming up so that you can uh, see those. And a lot of times people are unaware, and then when they buy that because they, they're buying it for the color, you should hear how excited they are when they call on the phone or they bring one in and they want to know if they have something new and exciting. And yes, it is. It's new and exciting for almost all people because they're not familiar with that. Now, um, there are a number of different shaped tulips, okay? And uh, uh, when, when we look, this is a, a double tulip for you. And um, then this one is uh, generally what uh, we would look at as an emperor tulip. It's uh, tall and narrow, and then they uh, flare out at the top like this. Now, we look at these pictures, and one of the things people always say is, you know, I wish my tulips looked like they did in the picture. Mine all pop open. They look like this for a couple of days, and then after a couple of days go by, yes, they get tired and they flop open. You have to remember that the Flowers will last for about two weeks, and usually if you are to think about you trying to stay awake and do something for two weeks, after about the second or third day, you're kind of tired, you'd be willing to flop open too. So, okay, um, that, that's uh, some of the things that will happen to your bulbs, and so I, I want you to, to be aware of that. Um, your... Uh, your tulips that look like these, uh, I don't know, perfect bulb like here. These are uh, Darwinian type bulbs or uh, Darwinian type tulips, excuse me, um, for you to look at there. And then uh, these guys are, are a tulip species and you can see that their bulbs in here are tiny, tiny, tiny. And these, uh, I believe, are little uh, Narcissus uh, tulips. So I can let you see that as they're being passed around to enjoy those. All right. So, um, again, with, with uh, looking at these packages, and it says early spring, mid spring, late spring, we talked about the crocus over here. And uh, on the, the crocus, it'll say um, early spring down here. And so you can plant some early spring crocus with some early spring daffodils with some early spring um, uh, other bulbs like your, your uh, grape hyacinths there. And then you can have a big cluster of flowers all at one time, just a real riot going on and being able to enjoy those. And then once those are dying down, you can have another set of flowers coming in um, to take over. Now, one of the, the main issues that people have is they say, you know, I plant these flowers and they come up, they bloom, they look pretty for a couple weeks, and then they die down, and then I've got all this ugly foliage. How soon can I cut it off? I normally like to try and uh, persuade people not to go and, and uh, do that, but because uh, the foliage ends up feeding the bulb so that the bulb can be, get bigger and be able to bloom for you the following year. And people are kind of made by that. And um, over in Holland, where they, they uh, grow bulbs and where they, anywhere else, one of the interesting things that they will do is when they're growing seed bulbs, is they will get the flowers to start coming up. 
you know, they have them all planted out there. They're all looking gorgeous. They've just got a hint of color. And then they take this big lawnmower and they mow off all the flowers, okay? And so what ends up happening is the bulb does not expend the energy to get the flower to open and keep it open, but they can then make sure that all the bulbs in that area were true to variety, and then they can go through and they can harvest it. But because it expended all the energy, it gets to be a much bigger bulb for you. And so um, when you are looking at, at your bulbs in your yard, a lot of times people will buy a big bulb and they'll plant it, and then a couple years goes by and they get ready to dig it up, and they say, geez, my bulbs are pretty small now. Well, they're small because of the flowering that happens and because we have very poor soil in our area. Now, I should point out that I was negligent in, in telling you that I always recommend that you add some organic matter to the soil, whether it's compost or some uh, aged manures or, you know, just anything that you can put out. I talked to a lady yesterday. She was um, real excited because she was doing uh, uh, coffee grounds and banana peels and uh, getting, you know, a great garden that way. But it's just adding organics into the soil, which is really beneficial for us. Uh, to end up doing. And uh, when you do that, it, it really helps the bulb and the flower of anything that you're dealing with grow to be a larger size than what you would if you do nothing to our soil here. All right. Um, we'll move on here down to our uh, narcissus. And we can start down here. And uh, daffodils are in the Narcissus family. Paper whites are in the Narcissus family. Okay. Uh, who is good with uh, history here and know where we get the name Narcissus? Any? Oh, okay. One smirky young customer here. So, uh, a little Greek action, that's right. There was a, a young man who thought he was so good looking and everything. Uh, he walked out in front of a bus one day or something like that and got killed, if I remember right. Except uh, the bus wasn't a bus. It was like a, a chariot or something. And, uh, you know, uh, he thought his good looks would, would save him. Uh, now, Narcissus are a very attractive bulb, okay? But their good looks don't save them from the horrors of having ugly foliage in the, the summer. And so again, whenever possible, I would want you to go through and plant some other plants with your bulbs, okay? And you can either plant annuals or you can plant some perennials. Uh, one of my favorites with uh, uh, the crocus is to go in and plant... Uh, uh, some low ground covers because the crocus are short bulbs and I can put something in like uh, plumbago which is later to come up and then it has a great um, fall flower and the foliage turns red the fall flower is blue um, so we can end up looking at doing something like that with your daffodils and your tulips because they they come up a little later um, you may want to put something in there that takes a little longer to get going in the spring. Maybe like uh, some mums or some asters. Uh, you can interplant with those or you can also go in with something like petunias or marigolds. But you just want to make sure that you don't overwater the site and keep them too soggy because they'll end up um, molding and uh, rotting for you. Now, um, with this package of Narcissus, uh, these are called the naturalizing mix. And again, they don't have the biggest flower heads. Those big flower heads are generally your daffodils. Okay, um, These are going to be generally a little smaller. And a lot of times your Narcissus have a little more fragrance to them. Now, Narcissus are not poisonous, but they're not exceptionally tasty. Okay. 
Your tulips over here are very tasty. They're like cake and ice cream uh, to the rodents and narcissus and daffodils usually don't taste too good but they will like to, uh, especially the squirrels, they'll dig them up from here and then they'll relocate them over there for you. So if you're uh, trying to go and make some beautiful display and you've got a squirrel population uh, in your neighborhood, uh, it's always nice to, to be aware and to go and do uh, a mix like that or to realize what's going to end up happening. Now, um, a little a couple of years ago, they came out with pink uh, daffodils for you, and customers buy them and they plant them out. They come back and they're generally a little disappointed because um, when it first comes out, they're not pink. And if you plant them where they're in full sun, which it pretty much says you can plant it in full sun, the sun here uh, fades the color and so that they're not pink. So if you're going to be planting your daffodils that have the pink cup here, uh, you want to go and you want to put them where they get morning sun and afternoon shade and just realize when they first come out they won't be pink, but uh, they won't fade for you like if you were to put them out in full sun. So that's a handy little thing to uh, realize. Um, next you've got some uh, doubles. And uh, this one, uh, replete, here is uh, white with orange interior and uh, kind of unique in that aspect. Again, uh, these are, are very easy to end up growing and uh, your doubles are generally a little different for you. Um, let's see here. This, this mix down here is a fragrant mix. These all are going to have basically your cups. The smaller the cup, generally the more fragrant the uh, Narcissus is going to be for you. So um, it's one of those things you can be on the lookout for. And then um, There are some like Barrett Browning. These are uh, a nice white with a, a really good orange cup to it. And uh, Pheasant Eye is going to be, or uh, this is Geranium. This one here is also uh, going to have multiple um, stalks for you here so that you get a lot more flowers off from these and this has generally well pheasant eye has a green center uh, geranium is a stronger smeller than what Barrett Browning is so when you're out there looking at those you can get an idea between those now um, in the bags here your, uh, I don't have um, one that's out and open, but these are your giant yellow flowering uh, uh, trumpet daffodils. These have the biggest flowers, the biggest heads on them, the biggest cups, and uh, they are exceptionally easy to grow again. And uh, we have them, um, you know, mixed like that in a little bag for you if you want or else they also come in large bags of like uh, 225 and when you're out looking at uh, at your bulbs there's grading sizes and I didn't talk to you about size earlier but on some bulbs, it's the size of the bulb, which is the grading size. And then on your daffodils, it's how many um, bulblets it has to the side, generally, which tells you uh, how big it is. And the bigger the bulb, the bigger the flower you're going to end up having. 
So uh, there are times when you can go and, you know, they send out a lot of uh, bulb catalogs for you to be looking at. And uh, um, they'll, they'll tell you, you know, what a great deal it is to buy these. And you can get 300 or 500 or something like that. And here in the, the bag, this is um, the mid-size, okay? It uh, is just a single bulb like this. This is called a DN1 or a, a single nose. This has one nose. If it had uh, had a baby or a, a buddy to it and it looked like this, then it would be called a DN2 or a double nose. And if it had one, excuse me for getting <laughs> paper on your feet here. If it had been like this, that was a DN3. Okay, your DN3s, you get a whole lot less number of bulbs, but you get much bigger bulbs and a lot more when you're buying um, your flowers if you're just putting a single grouping out there for you. Now, uh, DN3s are costing a lot more these days than they um, used to because of uh, freight. <laughs> Nobody's heard anything about that, I'm sure. Um, but uh, generally, um, when you're out looking, you can do some comparisons. Look at the size of the bulb if you're looking in the catalog or whether you're out shopping at any of the stores. Uh, sometimes it'll be by the same company, um, like, you know, this says Simple Pleasures. You may go someplace else, you may see Simple Pleasures, and they may be one or two dollars cheaper, and you'll say, oh, you know, they're trying to really rip me off. But if you end up looking at, at it, it'll tell you on there in a number of areas that... Uh, Well, actually, huh. well, this one doesn't tell you the size of the bulb itself, um, but uh, some of the other companies will tell you what size that is in that package so that you have a good understanding of what you're buying. And I feel that that's important for the end consumer to uh, have a good understanding. Um, all right, um, we've got uh, a couple other bulbs that we can go over kind of quick, and then we can wrap this up. Uh, like chorus here, um, a lot of times as a kid we were called we called these naked ladies, uh, and uh, they'll come up and they'll bloom just out of the ground with no no leaves or anything around the base. They uh, we'll, we'll flower for you, the flower dies down, and then the leaves come um, later for you. But uh, these are marginal here for being planted out in the open. Generally, the people that put these against the house on the east or uh, south side of the house, these will work out quite well. If you put them where they're very exposed because of the height of them, uh, they don't perform uh, exceedingly well for you. Um, there are some other small specialty bulbs um, for you also. We've got um, your alliums, and uh, alliums are in the onion family, and in the bag it's just, it's got some packaging in here to keep the onion bulb from getting squished. But uh, it ends up coming up and making this nice stalk for you and, and having this big purple um, lollipop looking flower up at the top. Um, I had made mention earlier in the program here about garlic. Now, if you want to be tricky, you can end up planting or interplanting garlic and alliums or onions in with your tulips. And this helps... Uh, throw off some of the critters from the scent or the smell of what you're doing because the odors can be quite strong. 
Now I usually find that the garlic does best and uh, garlic itself has a nice small white flower for you. It's another bulb. A lot of times people don't realize that garlic flowers, um, but that works quite well. And on the back here you can kind of see this little boy looking at these giant flowers. I have yet to ever see um, <laughs> them that big, especially in Nevada. But even in California, when I've been over to California, where you know everything grows big and glorious and wonderful, I still haven't seen that. Okay, um, another plant that you can end up uh, putting out to fool some of the critters are your uh, fritillarias areas here, and. Um, they are a very interesting looking flower and they also have a very interesting uh, fragrance to them and generally one fritillaria will go and keep a lot of critters away for a large area. Um, I wouldn't say a whole lot but it's going to uh, take up you know a side yard or a front yard or backyard and I'll pass this around uh, you don't have to handle the bulb, but you'll be able to find out why the fragrance is one there that can be deceiving. And uh, you should also realize that they uh, have that same perfume scent. <laughs> you trust her, huh? That's right. It smells like a skunk. Okay. <laughs> but... Uh, um, don't have to usually. <laughs> that they're interesting looking creatures, and they're not really a, a bulb. They're uh, more of a corm. And should you be interested in what corms are, they're in the little handout. It's just a a different type of uh, storage system that uh, Mother Nature makes. Instead of uh, uh, you know, a potato is a tuber. And sometimes people, you know, look at them and are like, oh, you know, it's kind of like a bulb. You plant it and things grow up from it. Um, there are some other uh, unique uh, flower bulbs out there that are also called the specialties. Um, I don't have any of those right now. Um, they, uh, bless you. Um, they uh, end up doing quite well in our area, but uh, uh, and the, the creatures usually don't bother them. Uh, some of the names are like Snowdrops, Star of Bethlehem, um, uh, are two of the more common of the specialty ones, and they're a small white bulb, and they're quite pretty. They're an early spring bloomer, just... Uh, don't have any this year for you to see. Um, but uh, try and remember that when you're for bulbs here in the catalogs or whether you're shopping any place, um, you want to remember that here in northern Nevada, most of us are uh, zoned USDA 6, which means that usually our average winter low ranges somewhere between 0 and minus 10. And uh, if you're looking in a sunset book, we're usually a zone three because sunset did its own thing, didn't follow the government. Um, and so people are sometimes confused, you know, are we a zone three or are we a zone six? But again, a zone three in anything that's sunset, okay, if it's a sunset book, a sunset magazine, anything that is titled sunset in there, we are going to be a zone three. Anything else that you look at uses usually the government's designation and we are a zone six. And so um, as long as you realize that or know that our average winter lows are between zero and minus ten, then you can usually go through and, and have a good idea of what bulbs to end up uh, putting in and uh, what you can expect. Now, um, other questions that people usually have is I have a bunch of bulbs and they don't look so good. Uh, what do I do? 
a number of times I will tell you that you can end up just digging them up, saving the big ones, and throwing all the little ones away if you want, because um, it's a lot of work to go back through, break them up, plant all the little ones out there. And normally you want to end up having spacing on, uh, like your tulips, about five for every square foot for a big presentation. And uh, you can be looking at that if you're one of those people that can't give up on, on anything. You know, you love those plants. They've tried so hard. You know, I'm going to give them every chance I've got. Then you can uh, take them. But uh, um, there's a lot of work trying to go out and plant those little bulblets that may have broken off. If your soil is bad, I have seen tulips growing on top of the ground. I've seen hyacinths coming up almost below, right below the ground. I've seen daffodils uh, growing almost on top of the ground because the soil down below hasn't been prepared well. Um, Anytime you can help the soil by incorporating organics in there, by putting some fertilizer down, you're going to be very surprised. And I will tell you, plant fewer bulbs and fewer plants, but work the soil, and you'll be much happier than going out and buying a hundred and then not having enough time to prep it right and just kind of digging some shallow graves and throwing them in there and uh, calling it good because uh, generally a lot of times the bulbs don't perform well in those types of situations. Now, uh, people will always say, well, how soon, how late can I plant the bulbs? Bulbs are pretty intelligent. If you were to plant them now in September, um, they're not going to start growing new tops right away. Okay, They won't flower in December. The weather is going to be the controlling factor as well as the sunlight itself. When there's less sun, seeds, a lot of seeds don't germinate and won't live and grow to any extent. Okay, But planting them early while the soil is warm will go and initiate root growth, which will help the plant become a bigger plant. You can buy the same bulb plant one now and plant one in February and the one now will usually be almost twice the size as the one that you would have planted in February because it has managed to get its roots out and become an established plant before spring happens okay and uh, so people say well when when's the latest I can plant well the latest you can plant is usually Valentine's Day okay and have any real success. Now the other thing that you normally want to do is you want to make sure that the bulb is usually nice and plump and firm and uh, you know you can squeeze them. Um, some bulbs like uh, um, I w had made mention on the uh, tulips if you have uh, a couple of noses sticking up out of there and you squeeze it they may squish together a little bit but they're still nice and firm you know like your arm your forearm is usually firm okay so you want to feel for for firmness like that you don't want to ever pick something up and have it kind of squish down like um, you know a rubber egg or anything like that and it just right um, you, you want to look for that. You normally don't want stuff that has a lot of weird looking fungus growing on it or mildew or mold, things like that. Now sometimes some bulbs are just prone to it. You know I have uh, looked and there's one variety of bulbs that came in and almost every year it has a mold on it. I call the company they say yeah it just happens in cold storage and there's you know they treat it and the mold just comes. It's like it's inbred in it but uh, that's one variety out of everything that we bring in so um, you can look for for that normally the sooner you can buy the bulb in the fall sometime in September or October you get the best selection and you get the firmest bulb 
okay, and you usually can find the biggest bulbs. Um, I, I have been places where it's been July of the following year and there's places still trying to sell bulbs and it's just like, no, don't even go there. And uh, um, I don't want you to, to think that you can buy them in the, in the summer or spring next year and have any real success in planting them and having them come up. Over winter, bulbs generally need, you know, a drink a month. And that's about it. And um, I get a lot of calls from people in the spring because they, you know, February will come or March comes and some of the bulbs are poking through the soil and they're like, are my bulbs going to freeze? No, they won't. Bulbs won't freeze. The flowers won't freeze until they're all the way basically open. Okay. Once they're open, that is the point when they're most susceptible to wind and freezing temperatures. Okay, once they're still secluded or in their envelope or, or heads hanging down, anything like that, they are still very accustomed to cold weather, okay, and, and you don't have to worry about, you know, whether they're going to come out or not. They can have snow on top of them, you know, all that stuff that, that people are, are paranoid about. Um, you know, you don't have to usually worry on bulbs. They're pretty intelligent. They won't uh, won't do anything wrong out there for you. The question is, is can you plant most bulbs in planters? Uh, you're going to find that a small pot, you get most everything to freeze and become mush. And if you buy a big pot, you know, something about this big, you're going to do much better. Don't plant all the way to the edges I have found. Um, in the handout it shows you uh, how to do a layered bulb planting and they do show you the bulbs going all the way to the edge. Normally I will uh, inform people that don't put it towards the last two inches because if you're putting a pot out there and you're going to let it be exposed those edges are where it dry or where it freezes and thaws uh, repetitively, okay, the interior of the pot is where it's going to stay, um, uh, the core will stay more controlled, okay, and if you can end up, if I can borrow this for a second, mm -hmm. um, so here's the, the picture that we're looking at, and it shows bulbs going all the way from one side to the other, and it shows tulips and daffodils at eight inches, Hyacinths or crocus usually here at uh, five inches in soil above and below and in between. But um, I'm just not asking you to plant the outer perimeter. And uh, um, that will go. And, and uh, if you uh, are interested, I would have you, um, if you're doing these pots, buy some uh, white alyssum seed. It sprouts up very easily. And you just wring the edge of the pot with that, and then the alyssum will come up and grow out and start give you some color and, and fragrance right at the same time while the bulbs are doing their thing. And it actually makes the pot look a whole lot better than if you just put your straight bulbs in there. White alyssum or sweet alyssum, it's a, an annual bedding plant, and you can buy the seed or buy the plants. It grows quite easy from seed and uh, does a, a great job in that, that venue there for you. Yes, you can do the crocus, but again, you try and plant them more in the center and don't expect a whole lot for those that you may have planted too close to the edge. Okay, um, it reminds me of the story about how the elephant got its trunk, don't go too close to the edge of the river, well I'm telling you don't go too close to the edge of the pot because there's um, issues there. What about iris? Alright, um, iris, um, iris are going to be coming here I'm hoping next week, I thought they would have been here this week, um, and iris are one of those, it's uh, um, 
it's a rhizome, okay, because it spreads across the top of the soil, and you know, it, yeah, it, I don't mean to be too technical, but you know, for those of you who are interested, but uh, uh, there are a number of different um, iris out there, and the the big bearded iris that a lot of times people are looking for. Um, those are one of the great items that you can easily plant in the fall and by doing so they give you a much bigger plant come next spring. Uh, with your iris there are your um, spring flowering iris and then there's your re-blooming iris uh, so they'll bloom in the spring and then again in the fall so you can be looking for those and I think they like five colors that are re-bloomers for you. Uh, but iris don't like to be planted very deep. They're a shallow uh, plant, usually down two, maybe three inches. Uh, the other thing that uh, a lot of times you can be looking for in the fall would be your uh, uh, peonies. And um, peonies also like to be planted very shallow. And they're a, a root, and uh, um, a true root that way. So we can be looking for those and usually we get them in about four colors, three or four colors. And uh, lastly, you can look, um, people are always interested in, in doing daylilies. Daylily division in the fall and, and planting them now is probably the best time also for you. So if you have daylilies, um, do those, dig them, cut them back, cut the foliage back. Normally, I wouldn't divide them every year. Um, on your iris and your uh, daylilies, maybe every three to five years. And on your peonies, I would tell you they last 100 years and they never get out of control. They never get too old. But you can always go in and cut a portion off if you want, usually when it's dying down. Um, or you can dig it up and divide it, usually this time of the year. And it's very hard. Most people are like, oh, there's still foliage up. Yeah. Well, I go and get my hair cut, and my hair is still attached to the side of my head. <laughs> okay. But I, I realize that, you know, some things have to be done. And uh, so you can divide now. On the peonies, they come up and they bloom, but the bud never opens. Um, there can be a couple of things that are going on, and generally the number one thing that I would look at first is a, a wonderful little tiny worm hair type insect called a thrip. And uh, thrips are, are an insidious little pest. They get into uh, snapdragons and yuccas and petunias and peonies and roses and just a myriad of flowers and you may never see it. But if you rip the flower apart, and sprinkle it on a white piece of paper. You pull the petals out. Then after 10 to 30 seconds, you'll see these little golden brown threads start moving. And they're, they're quite small, but you, you can see them wiggle. Well, I might be needing glasses here one of these days. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, you know, <sighs> some of us may need a magnifying glass. Let's uh, put it that way. Um, in order to see them, but uh, once you have thrips, they usually stay around there for a while, and there are a number of different products that you can put down. If you haven't tried the uh, tree and shrub systemic, or the rose and flower systemic, or the spray that works the best is called uh, um, Isotox. Isotox, I-S-O-T-E-X, I believe, or O-X. Um, and that you can spray directly on the flower and will kill the bug inside. It's one of the few products that you can spray on the flower that will penetrate through. But uh, that will help you with your peony. It will help you with uh, other items, possibly roses, things like that. The other side might be is that... Uh, with peonies, if they're planted too deep, uh, they won't flower. And so peonies, normally, you want to have the eye, the little pointy part, 
of the root that uh, grows from right at the, the soil surface. You want to say, you know, just put it shallow, shallow pit and plant it in there and then put it on. If they're planted too deep, they won't bloom. And it may be that uh, um, they're getting to the point where they're not that deep and that may be causing part of this. Uh, the other area could be that you've got high alkali in your soils, which is causing a deformity. But ants are not needed for you to have the flowers open. Okay, uh, if you plant your garlic in the fall, you're going to go and get your garlic. You harvest your garlic in late summer or fall. And if you uh, are interested, Bentley down here, he usually grows a lot of garlic for us. And so you can kind of watch him. Uh, if you're down into Gardnerville area, driving back and forth. Uh, but he should have had it all harvested a couple of weeks ago and shipped it off. It's been processed and now it comes back. So um, what we may be selling you here may have come from Bentley's. <laughs> Irises that, that don't bloom anymore usually are they're too crowded. Okay. You've got them too close together. You haven't divided them. And uh, sometimes they just get too old. And um, well, their lifespan will be, you know, 10 to 20 years at times. But, <laughs> but you know, you know, yeah. you know uh, I'll relate it back to, to strawberries and things like this. You're, the, when you first plant your strawberry, it, uh, it grows, has flowers, and has fruit, and sends out runners. Then the second year, it will have some flowers and some fruit, but it won't send out any more runners. And the third year, it'll have flowers and fruit, and it'll be done. It won't ever flower and fruit anymore, because it's made its children, and the children now have to do it, and it's happy being a grandparent. Okay? No more children when you're a grandparent. No more... <laughs> Flowering when you're a grandparent, no more. Okay. Sometimes they get too old. Now um, I mentioned the uh, the German or bearded iris. There's also your Dutch iris, which is a bulb, and I don't uh, see any of those, but they normally come in a blue for you or in a white, and they have a very fine blade, and they'll come up and. Uh, they will uh, bloom at a different time and the flower sits up and, and falls open. And uh, that is a bulb that you buy now. If you're looking for Japanese iris or Louisiana iris or any of the other iris, normally you don't ever find those um, in the fall. You only find them in containers. And I can't tell you why, but I've never found anybody that really goes and sells bulk Japanese iris for the consumer to plant in the fall. And I don't know why. You dig them up, okay, and then you try and get most of the soil off and then you, you'll look and you have a big ugly looking root with a head kind of like a, a warty slug or something like that. And uh, you chop the little arms off that make the other ones and that's one of the easiest ways to do it, or you can cut them in half, anything to split them up. Now, you can do a couple of things, such as uh, sit out for two to three days and heal over or scab over uh, so that they um, don't get insects infecting in them, in there, after you cut them. It's the same with potatoes. Um, there are some people that like to go and they get a little bit of the uh, sulfur powder and they uh, sprinkle some sulfur on the ends when they cut them to uh, seal them up that way. Uh, so that's another one that you can do. And uh, the bulb dust here um, has garlic powder and cedar oil in it and you can um, dust with that uh, on the cut edges also. So. And if you, you know, if you cut bulbs when you're digging them up, um, usually the bulb isn't going to produce if you slit it right, right down the center. But if you just took and kind of winged it, 
um, you can throw it back in the hole and usually it's just fine. Okay, so um, it, you don't need to have that perfect round bulb in order to have flowers, but uh, the less damage that you do to them, the better off you are. So. Tulip bulbs lifespan is usually around three to five years. Uh, in Holland, well, well, let me say in Europe, okay, they usually say one year. They they love their bulbs over there. They'll rip them out after one year and throw them away, and plant new ones. You know, if you were to go into a nursery in in England, this whole room would be nothing but bulbs, and people would be buying them like crazy. Um, and they do it every year. It's just a commodity for them. It's like you buying milk or Starbucks or, you know, a donut or anything. If you've kept them in the refrigerator, there's a good chance that they may still be good. Um, I would choose you to squish them between your fingers. If they're firm, then you can end up planting them still. But uh, if they're not firm, I know uh, years ago I was single and I left an onion in the refrigerator for like three years, maybe. <laughs> okay. And I kept eating a little bit off at a time. But, uh, you know, now that I'm married, I realize that I'm not supposed to do things like that. Um, <laughs> you know, eat it while it's fresh type of idea is what's been ingrained in me now. It's, if they're firm, it's still worth a try. But if they're not, but... Uh, no, no. And, you know, if you, if you know that you can't plant them now, okay, and uh, you're going to plant them a little later, put them in your refrigerator to start them to be chilled because that's a good point. Um, chilling them helps with the flower production. If uh, you're going to force them, you can take bulbs. Hyacinths, I think, make great forced bulbs because they're fragrant. Um, I have seen people take them and just take them right out of the, the baggie here and put them in the hyacinth jar and force them right there. The flowers are usually about this big. But if you chill them, um, you know, they have been pre-chilled for a while, maybe two weeks or something like that. If you can chill them for like six to eight weeks, the bulbs will be like twice the size. And so uh, you can pre-chill them and, and there are... Um, Hyacinths are, are one of my favorites. You can do some uh, tulips. Normally, if you look on the box, it'll tell you good for forcing. Um, and I don't see any right off. Uh, there are a few uh, uh, daffodils that you can force also, but generally we force your paper whites. And your culture come here, you can end up forcing if you want. Put them in the crisper. Okay. And the, the best thing for you to be sanitary now is they have, uh, I think it's Ziploc came out with a vegetable bag. Okay, it's got these micro holes in it to allow gases to interchange. Take it and put it in that so that, you know, I told you that your hyacinths are poisonous. I don't want you to be having hyacinth skin falling out mixed with your three-year-old onion that... Um, <laughs> On your hamburger or something like that. Now, there are different degrees of poisoning, okay? And it, that, you know, you're going to take a bite out of this and go over and take the long dirt nap or whatever. But, uh, um, you know, it's just one of those things you want to be careful of. But those, those vegetable baggies would be the very best ones that I'd have you put them in. And then you can just store them in there or put them in a paper bag. Um, and put them in the refrigerator. The issue with the paper is that sometimes um, the paper doesn't breathe as well, and uh, uh, you can get gases to build up, which cause you to get mold going in there. You want to cut the foliage back, because on the daylilies, if you're going to divide them now, you want to cut the foliage down, okay? Only if you're going to cut them down now, dig them up, divide them, and then stick them back in the ground the same day if you can. Okay? My daylilies are pretty old too, so, um, so would, it, would it help at this point to still divide them? And sure. Yeah. But they don't bloom that much either, so. 
Yeah, and you know, throw some fertilizer in with them and throw some, if you haven't tried, you know, pay dirt or bumper crop or one of those, you know, great soil organic blends that we sell, you know, you'll be real happy to give it a whirl and see how it works for you. Um, but put those down in there and, and you should be thrilled with what uh, results you end up getting. As far as the dry leaves over the bulbs and plants like that, um, there are a couple of people in this world. There's the A type people and there's the B type people and then there's the C's and the D's. Um, you know, generally the A's want everything cleaned up for fall. They don't want to have a mess in the spring. And uh, at times I have found that uh, cleaning everything off means that I don't have any disease overwintering, I don't have any bugs overwintering, and sometimes it means I don't have any plants overwintering on some of them, okay? But it's just some. But most of the plants, like the tulips and the hyacinths and anything else that I want to overwinter, that is a strong perennial, cleaning it up in the fall is, is great because I feel that it reduces the amount of uh, material that I have to hide insects in and uh, diseases and you know people say it's Nevada how many diseases can we have well you know we've got mildew and mildew is one of those things that will hide you know almost anywhere and aphids hide now I know everybody has you know jumps up for down for joy when they get aphids oh boy I've got aphids I've got aphids you know yeah <laughs> because the ladybugs then come I guess you know but uh, not enough of them, that's right. So, you know, um, get that area cleaned up. I usually find it does well. If you want to do something, don't put straw down, okay? A lot of times you'll read in these magazines, oh, put straw down or hay down over your flower beds. Generally, it's very full of weed seed or straw, hay, seed, you know, and you get all these grasses growing up in your flower bed. Not, not one of the better things. Um, recently, uh, uh, Full Circle Compost has um, this real heavy brown soil type stuff, soil essence, or I'm not, I can't remember what he calls it, but he's, you can put that down on top and it doesn't blow. Um, it's, you know, kind of like all the grit and grime and stuff of everything that fell off, uh, heavy, heavy, heavy material. Um, and that seems to work out well, but you don't want anything that attracts the voles in there, you know, gives the rodents a place to hide. Shredded bark usually doesn't allow rodents to hide much in that if you do the cedar or the redwood, or you can go in and use the chips. Um, generally, I would say chips are the better one to use because you never know, some squirrel may end up packing off all the cedar mulch that you may be daintily placing over the tops of your plants or else the wind just may pick it up with the tumbleweed and blow it away. Thank All right, thank you.